Okay, our second speaker of the day will be uh, Chris Cousins, who will tell us about anomalies of 2D SCFTs from RAP D3 brains in F theory. Take it away, Chris. Yep. Uh, thanks, uh, Cody and John, for letting me speak and for putting on the seminar series. So, as Cody said, I'm going to be talking about anomalies from 2D SFTs, which we can obtain from black strings in F theory. So, this was work done with two PhDs in Utrecht, uh, Hybert and Gillian, and also my boss, Stefan. And in the first paper in 1904, oh, sorry, in the first paper in 1904, we look at this not in F theory, but on a K3. And then we generalize it to F theory in this later paper. And I also want to highlight this paper here, which was by these three authors and also Thomas Grimm, which has similar uh, overlap with what we have been doing here. So the basic motivation for what we wanted was to look at a microscopic counting of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy for some classes of black holes. Um, so the holy grail of this program is to be able to have some uh, gravity computation, which is the macroscopics, and you have some matching microscopic, which is the field theory computation, and hopefully they agree. And this would then give you an idea of how the microstates of the black hole were encoded in some field theory. So the first example of this was done by Stromager and Baffa in 96 or 5, I forgot. Um, and where they look at 5D black holes on in uh, type 2B, essentially, and they put these black holes on K3 times S1. And by counting all the different ways you can wrap uh, brains on the, on the basically the cycles of the K3, you can work out the spectrum of the uh, field theory. And from here, you can get a match in with the gravity uh, computation of the entropy, which is using basically uh, Bekenstein Hawking. So it's roughly the area of the horizon. So this was extended to 5D black holes in M-theory on the Clavier threefold by Vafa, I think the year later, and then to 4D black holes in M-theory on Clavier threefolds times an S1. And this was by Malacena, Strominger, and uh, Witten, which I'll just refer to as MSW. So more recently, people have looked at um, black strings arising in F-theory, and this will be uh, the topic of this talk. So we will focus on extremal black objects, which essentially means that the temperature is zero. So when you take the near horizon limit, you get an ADS factor. So ADS CFT goes some way to explaining the origin of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. You have some ADS factor in the near horizon, so you have some dual uh, SCFT, and this should account for at least some of the micro, the, all the microstates of the black hole. But you have to be slightly careful here with uh, what I will what is called uh, black hole hair, and I will come back to this a bit later. So one of the curious things is that these black holes here I've mentioned are asymptotically flat. So this was in 95, 6, um, and you'd think, okay, ADS CFT was, should be very useful for this program, but it was only in 2015 that the first asymptotically ADS black holes had a microscopic counting of the entropy, uh, and this has essentially due to uh, this is due to needing to compute the partition function of these SCFTs and the technology has only recently become available. So final motivation is that um, I think Gary's in the audience, but uh, Gary, Kim and uh, Vafa have some swampland constraints where they were looking at 60 um, gravity theories and they were using constraints uh, on um, strings essentially in this gravity theory and looking at the SCFT of these strings. And this is essentially what we're doing as well. We're looking at the string, the SCFTs on these strings. Uh, and I will try to say some words at the end uh, about this. Okay, so the way we're going to construct these strings is we're gonna take D3 brains and we're gonna wrap them on curves inside an elliptically fiber clabby R threefold. We can also insert K3 here, which was the earlier work, but I will restrict to this um, F theory case in the majority of this. And then we're going to probe these D3 brains by either ALE or ALF spaces. So you can take uh, a near horizon geometry. Uh, you take the near horizon, you go straight to the strings, and this is what you get from this near horizon geometry. And it's kind of independent of whether it's the ALE or ALF. All that matters is what it looks like in the center. 
which is this gamma, and I'll explain it a bit later. So you have some ADS3, so ADS CFT says there's some 2D SCFT, and you can see that this is an, a 0.4 SCFT living on these black strings. And the goal was to uh, be able to compute this macroscopically, but we uh, restrict ourselves to just doing this macroscopically, so we can make some predictions about this. So one of the important results that we find is that the classical contributions to this is not uh, enough. You also have to supplement this with both high derivative corrections, which I will also call classical, and also these one loop corrections, which are kind of like the quantum, uh, quantum parts. And this is obtained by integrating out um, massive KK towers of states. So this is the 10D setup. We have uh, some base of some Clavier threefold here. Uh, we have some curve inside this Clavier, which is the D3 brain wraps. And then we have the D3 brain wrapping R times S1 and probed by this M gamma space. And then on top of this, we insert seven brains, uh, which follow this green here. And these can, in principle, be uh, stacks of uh, uh, non-trivial stacks of uh, PQ7 brains. And this depends on the singularities of this Clavier threefold. So strictly as a 10D solution in type 2B, this isn't very good because you also need not only D7 brains, but non-perturbative PQ brains. So the way to get around this is to either use MF duality and look at the M theory dual, or alternatively, you take you look at a 6D supergravity theory, which you can obtain from F theory on Clavier three folds. So it's this latter. Uh, option that we will take uh, in the following. And so this 60 theory, let me quickly describe how it's made. So these people here, Ferraro and Minashian and Sagnotti, and then Grimm and Bonetti, they basically reduced F theory on these Calabria three folds, and they also allowed for arbitrary singularities in the Calabria three folds. Um, by singularity, I don't mean like I1 fibers of the, um, the elliptic vibration. I, I mean uh, all the other uh, examples of the Kadaira uh, classification. So when you do this reduction, you get a gravity multiplet and also a number of vector tensor and hypermultiplets. So the vectors come about because of these singularities and tensors uh, and hypermultiplets as well, and tensors are um, basically for free. So you can organize this uh, matter content into representations of SU times SU2, and this will become important later. And the multiplicities that um, these uh, matter multiplets have is determined by the data of the threefold, for example, H11 and H21. So for us, this, um, this data is actually equivalent to the anomaly free condition for the effective field theory in 6D. Uh, and we will use these constraints uh, later. Um, so finally, the singularities, um, where you have the singularities in here, basically these parts here, these come around because you have stacks of seven brains, and these will give us non-abelian gauge theories uh, on their world volumes. And in the SCFT, this will be due to, to particular flavor symmetries that we can have. So this was the 6D supergravity theory, essentially, uh, that we want to consider. And this is the type of black string solutions that we can find in there. So you have some arbitrary, well, sorry, not arbitrary. You have some harmonic function H. You have these two one forms, beta and omega, and then also this scalar F. And this is determined once you specify this manifold here, which is um, has to be 4D uh, non-compact and Ricci flat metric. So once you've specified M gamma, you can essentially solve some um, ODEs for these other um, four seemingly un unconstrained uh, functions and one forms at the moment. The classification of these M gamma is given by their asymptotic properties. So this is uh, old maths literature work, and these are classified by uh, be belonging to either A, L, E, F, G, or H spaces. And what this means is that um, 
so for ALE, this is as asymptotic locally Euclidean. So at the boundary, well, at asymptotic, it looks something like R4 mod some quotient. For F, it looks like R3 times S1. And for H, G and H is R, R to the N times T to the N minus K, K minus M, sorry. So the important thing here is that near the center of all these spaces, they look locally like C2 mod gamma. So when you try to take a near horizon of this black string, whichever space you put here, you end up essentially with ADS3 process three uh, mod some gamma. So we had uh, both vector and hypermultiplets in this, but the only charge matter, uh, the only matter we need to actually turn on to support this black string are non-trivial tensor multiplets. And you can work out when you just try and compute the uh, charge of these tensor multiplets, the charge is fixed by this here. So this little q alpha is what you would call the microscopic charge. Um, and this is shifted by this term here um, due to string-like sources uh, that you introduced. So this q alpha is you take this curve C you write this, you decompose this into a basis of two forms on the base. And then the constant coefficients are these uh, Q alphas here. And similarly, the C alpha here are the constant coefficients when you expand uh, C1 of B, the first churn class of the base in terms of this um, basis. So it's actually possible, and we didn't actually pursue this, but we could actually shift this further by putting instantons on the seven brains. And this would be something interesting that I would like to look at in the future, possibly. So now what can we actually compute? So the things that we can actually compute nicely from supergravity without too much difficulty are the various levels of the current algebras and also the central charges of the black, uh, of the black strings. But there are some subtleties to actually doing this, and they mostly come about because of this near horizon versus asymptotic uh, viewpoint. So if you were just to look at the classical contributions, uh, you'd reduce the 6D theory to some 3D churn Simons by, uh, by essentially integrating over the compact space surrounding the strings. Uh, but you find if you do this in the near horizon geometry, you don't get everything. You kind of miss the black hole here. So you have to do this at asymptotic infinity. And the cheek, uh, cheeky way of seeing this is that the near horizon geometry is the same for ALE and ALF. Uh, you just get ADS3 times S3 mod gamma. But there's definitely something different. If you look at the field theory just on K3, for example, for ALE and ALF, you definitely have different contributions to the uh, entropy of these black strings. And the way to get the difference and to actually take into account of these here is to actually look at, do this reduction at asymptotic infinity. So for ALE on K3, you find that this perfectly matches, uh, there's no problem. If you try and do ALF, you find that there's, you're missing something. And the thing that you're missing is that you need to add in one loop contrib contributions that you get from integrating out the massive modes um, of the other multiplets. So you had the, the high par, the vector and the tensor multiplets, and you can, in um, you have a KK spectrum of this from the reduction uh, from F theory to 60, and you need to integrate out all these massive modes that you have. And these will actually contribute to these levels and central charges uh, quite non trivially. So let's just look at the simple classical contributions. So you have some 60 pseudo action for your supergravity theory, and we can integrate over this compact space, which in all cases is topologically S3 mod some uh, quotient of SU2. So the possible choice of this gamma are the discrete subgroups of SU2. So this is either uh, Zn, the dihedral group, or the exceptional groups 6, 7, and 8. So depending on which one you choose, it gives you different isometries of your solution. So if it's Zn, you get also a U1L and an SU2R. And if you do the other two, you just get SU2R. The U1 gets completely broken. Well, it gets broken to a discrete subgroup. 
So to compute the, um, the transcendence levels, you take a variation of this reduced 3D action and you basically pick out the uh, coefficient uh, of this variation. So the important part from 60 is this part of the action. So you have the uh, field strength of the tensors and then you have some coupling of the potential of the tensors with the trace R wedge R term. So when I said about the instantons earlier, you could have also added in a trace F wedge F term here, which would have also modified this definition of Q here. So if you just perform this recipe, uh, you get this fairly simple result that KL when it exists and the UNL exists and KR are the same and they're given by this simple uh, formula. It's just the intersection of this charge Q uh, with that multiplied by the norm of the uh, SU2 subgroup. And this is just this two derivative part in red here. So now we want to look at the four derivative part, which is this blue part and a similar computation uh, gives you the contributions. So if you notice this uh, two derivative thing, it didn't care if it was ALE or ALF. So you kind of are uh, ignoring the asymptotics in this case, but this becomes apparent when you look at the four derivative. So once you do this and you sub into this four derivative and do this reduction again, you find that you get these results here. So you notice that the KL when it exists is minus the KR in the ALE case. And uh, differently in ALF, you get a zero for the K left and K right. Curiously there, the um, if you sum KR minus KL, you get the same in both cases. And then also the difference between the left and right moving centric charges are uh, the same. So it's only in this, uh, once you've actually considered higher derivative terms, that you actually see the asymptotic differences between uh, ALE and ALF. Um, for those of you who are really paying attention, I've ignored G and H because there's issues with the existence of metri metrics, though strictly we don't actually need to use uh, the metrics on these spaces to work this out. So if I now take the total contribution, so I take the two derivative plus the four derivative, and I'm just gonna focus on the ALF, you get these somewhat ugly looking formulas, but they're somewhat nice as well. You have this curve that the D3 brain wraps. You have the first Pontryagin class of um, this ALE or ALF space, and you have the, the first churn class of the base of the Clavier threefold. And this is just multiplied by basically, this is essentially, um, um, m for zm or um, 2m plus 2 for dm. So these are quite simple and nice, but there's a problem. So if we take ALF and we take gamma equals zm, this is tau of nut space, and we can actually do a duality to a field theory that we know. And this is we take the um, T duality along the hot fiber inside the S S3 inside tau of nut, and then we can uplift this to m theory. And this is dual to this MSW uh, theory. So when you take this, you compare to MSW, you find that there's something missing. And this something missing are precisely these quantum corrections that I mentioned earlier. Before doing that, let's just quickly look at the non-abelian flavor symmetries. So we can do similar computations uh, to doing this. We again reduce the 60 action to on these by gauging the symmetries of these non-abelian non flavor symmetries and you end up with some left moving non-abelian current algebras and they're left moving because you look at the um, sign of the um, um, the k sorry i forgot what it's called the current algebra you get a a, a, a positive sign here so these um, non-abelian flavor symmetries arise because you have singularities uh, of the Clavier threefold. And over some certain divisors of this threefold, you have um, uh, singularities which you can't resolve. And you find that the contribution to the levels of the flavor symmetries is given by this relatively simple uh, formula, which involves the divisor and uh, the curve that the D3 brains were wrapping and the first churn class. 
So this is true for either ALE or ALF. Uh, there's no uh, difference. But we'll see shortly that when we take into consideration these uh, quantum corrections, that this actually gets modified as well. So as I just mentioned, tau not, we have something to compare to, and there's something missing. And these are all subleading terms. So we need to, if we follow uh, this early paper that I referenced in the first slide, if we follow Grimm, Hetland, Meyer, and Van Doren, uh, we see that we need to actually consider the contributions to these levels that you get from integrating out massive KK modes. So the ones that can contribute are precisely the ones that would lead to an anomaly in 6D. So we're using a 6D supergravity theory, which is anomaly free, uh, which relies on you to have a certain number of, of these various multiplets. But when you reduce down to 3D, uh, these can still contribute to these uh, levels, though you keep a non, uh, an anomaly free uh, 3D uh, theory. So the ones that can contribute to these anomalies in 6D are the gravitino, the spin half fermions from the tensor vector and hypermultiplets, and also, and also these anti-self-dual two forms, uh, which give rise to the tensors. So when you reduce this down to 3D, you end up with massive modes for the spin 3-2, spin half fermions, and you also you get some massive chiral vectors from uh, the self-dual two forms. So the curious thing, possibly, which I hope to explain in the next slide, is that only ALF gets these quantum corrections. ALE does not. So the way we can um, argue this is that if we think back to what we're actually doing, we're reducing on the spherical parts at asymptotic infinity uh, down to 3D. But ALE and ALF have very different asymptotic properties. So the spherical part is both in both is topologically S3 mod gamma. However, the way they approach this is very different. So for ALE, you have R4 mod gamma. So the S3 inside here has bas basically an infinite radius as you get um, closer to uh, asymp uh, the asymp asymptotic infinity. On the other hand, ALF, you approach R3 times S1, where this S1 is the hot fiber of the S3, and it keeps a constant radius. So you don't basically blow up the radius of this one. You blow up the radius of the S2 only inside the R3. Since these KK modes have masses which are inversely proportional to the radius of essentially the S3, for ALE, it's clear that they become massless, uh, so they can't contribute to the anomaly because it's only the massive modes that do. Whilst for ALF, we have this, since we have this circle still staying uh, finite size, uh, these modes remain massive and they must be taken into account. So the way we do this is we look at the spectrum of n equals 2,0,60 supergravity, which was constructed by uh, De Boer in 98. So this is organized into these SO4 reps uh, with the left and right. And then it's given, these are supplemented by a sign for the mass term. So for example, the spin half fermion, this is the direct equation for it, and it doesn't matter. And you can have either the positive or negative sign here. What happens is that the anomaly depends only on this sign here and not on the mass here. So to get the spectrum that we need, we take this uh, 2 comma 0 theory, we truncate it to, to 1 comma 0, and then we project out all the states which are not invariant under the subgroup gamma, which was um, the subgroup of SU2, which was basically the um, giving you the quotient at the center of the ALE or ALF space, uh, in this case, ALF, sorry. So, either, so to find how each of these states contribute to the anomaly, you can either do a one loop Feynman diagram um, for these states, how they contribute, or you can just uh, appeal to anomaly inflow and use the index theorem. Uh, so for a spin half field, if you, uh, the anomaly is canceled off if you add this counter term here where notice it's just the sign of the mass and not the mass itself. And this Q is defined in terms of characteristic classes of your manifold. So it's given by the A roof genus of M3 and then the churn um, polynomial of all the field strengths you have. So for us, this will have a 
basically an, a U1L, an SU2R, and all the possible flavor symmetries of the theory. So the only subtlety now is that we have an infinite tower of states, and even after the projection, we still have an infinite number. So we have to sum over uh, infinite, we basically get infinite sums where they where they seem something like sum over some integer to some power. So we need to regularize this. And to do this, we use uh, zeta function regularization. Um, you could probably be more careful with doing this, uh, but because the 60 theory is anomaly free, um, Pierre Corvillain showed that this was um, good enough. You can just use zeta function regularization. So I have spared you the gory details of what these uh, infinite sums look like, but the total contribution to these anomalies with taking both the classical and the quantum, you get these kind of nice formulas here. So one thing to notice is that the anomaly uh, for the non-abelian flavor symmetry, this charge shift has disappeared because of this quantum corrections. Uh, and also you get some extra terms in KL, KR, and C left minus CR from this. Um, but it's not so uh, clear from what I've written, but the most important bit was this. Now, if you were to compare to the field theory for ALF and the A series, uh, you find that this actually matches exactly with Tau of Nut, uh, sorry, with MSW, uh, which is just, this is just the Tau of Nut series. And this is one where you could dualize to MSW. And you get perfect agreement. Uh, and it was very essential to do this, that you had to take into account these quantum corrections. Okay, so ID, ideally, we'd have liked to have also been able to do the microscopic computation, but this is quite difficult. Um, and there's only partial results in the literature with which we could have compared to. So we began by trying to look at a spec the spectrum of these wrapped T3 brains, but you run quite quickly into problems. So in this paper by uh, Craig, Sakura and Timo, they looked at a single D3 brain in F theory, and then they looked at the spectrum of after wrapping this D3 brain on various clavier Um, But the, the problem here for us was that here they had to do a topological duality twist, but it, it was the abelian one, which was worked out by Martucci. For us, we always had to do a non-abelian topological duality twist, and this is completely unknown how to do this in the literature. Uh, we attempted to try it, but we kept failing because there were some issues with um, assigning charges to things. So the way we bypassed it was this MSW one, um, but we could also try and argue, can we do this for the other ALF? Unfortunately, this is also not the case because you don't end up with MSW, you end up with something more general. So MSW is wrapped M5 brains. If you try it to do for these other ALF, um, you end up with having to introduce orientifold M5 brains. And again, we're stuck at a problem with having to uh, uh, basically do MSW with orientifolds, and we didn't know how to do this. The alternative is to look at an M2 brain picture. Again, we get stuck because we have these ALE or ALF uh, spaces, which modify the spectrum. But something we were very close to achieving was we were using an anomaly polynomial given by Bar, Bonetti, Menachian, and Vec. So they worked this out for type 2b, which is basically the anomaly inflow. Uh, and we could suitably generalize it to an F theory. And we got almost all the contributions, minus a few, which we just never managed to iron out. But this looks like a very promising way of actually doing this computation in the future. So in my remaining minutes, I guess, uh, I'll just conclude. So we looked at some, uh, the current algebras of some 2D N equals 0, 4 SCFT. So we did this all macroscopically. Uh, and when possible, we compared to some micro, uh, microscopic computations. These SCFTs live on black strings. And in the first paper, we looked at this in K on K3, and in the second on F theory. One of the essential ingredients is to do these one loop uh, corrections from integrating out massive modes. Without this, it doesn't match at all. Um, and we should see these results as predictions for what the CF SCFT is, or as either, either a consistency check of some non-abelian topological duality twist, or some anomaly inflow for F-theory 
like in this BBMW pink bra. The other one is these results could potentially be used um, to put further swamp land constraints. This was done by uh, Kim, Xu, and Vafa, where they looked at string defects coupled to, vector, uh, to tensor fields. And these are pre precisely the type of supergravity solutions we've been looking at. And it could be possible that these give some extra constraints if you relax that the 6D supergravity theory comes from um, a string embedding as we have done. Thanks. All right, thank you, Chris, for the very nice talk. Let us all thank uh, Chris uh, with our clap emojis. Um, let, let me ask the first question. Did, did you have any, what, what were the restrictions on the curves that the D3 brains could wrap in the base? These curves should all be, um, if you want to pre preserve supersymmetry, the curve should actually be dual to the Kähler form. It should be the curve that's Poincaré dual to the Kähler form. I see. So it, it can't just be a um, an arbitrary holomorphic curve. It, it needs to be an be, actual Kähler well, device. You, you, yeah, you can you can show definitively that it has to be um, uh, it has to basically have a positive intersection number with any um, curve. So it has Good to be enough. ample. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Yinan. Uh, uh, hi. I just wonder, like, if you consider at this same setup in 4 F theory, so the in 4 F theory you have D3 brain wrapping over a complex curve on the base, then what are the fundamentally difference between this case and the 60 case you're talking about? Um... Uh, Super symmetry is broken to 0, 0,2. So for the 0, 0,2, it's a bit more difficult. The large amount of supersymmetry here makes things a lot easier. We never actually considered the 4D, but I I wouldn't actually know what the exact setup is, but I think you can do exactly what we have done precisely for it. I don't I think most of it would just follow from this. Yeah, like a geometric formula. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. I think the method that you use here would actually would be applicable there as well. I, I we haven't considered this yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, our next question is from Fabian. Hey, Chris. Hey. Can you explain a little bit more what the problem was with the topological twist and whether you could use the duality and then the result to say after the fact what the correct twist would have been? Um, yeah, okay. So um, what we wanted to do was, so there's a U1D symmetry of type 2B, um, which is basically the gauge subgroup of SL2Z. And under this, you have to assign charges to all the fields in the supergravity theory. Um, you can try to naively do this by basically fixing a charge for everything and then try and match to every uh, match to what you have. But when we were doing this, we were still having free uh, charges essentially at the end, and we didn't have any way of fixing these. And we would always be slightly off with something. Either we would have charges which weren't fixed, or um, we just wouldn't get the quite correct result. Um, I don't think I could be more, um, without writing stuff down, I don't think I could say much more. Did that answer your question though, or not? So you're saying the constraints are not enough to uniquely fix the SL2Z charges? From what we were doing, that seemed to be the problem. Whether we weren't doing it correctly enough is a, a valid question, uh, but from what we were doing, we weren't able to fix the charges. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, let us thank uh, Chris again. And a uh, big thanks to both Chris and Lars for the excellent talks.